In the top stories, government outlines how education will benefit from the 2017 budget. Tourism Minister reflects on advancements in human resource development. And Prime Minister Harris says the Federation is focusing on attracting high-end travelers. The details on these stories and more after the break. Welcome to the ZRZ Channel 5 newscast. I'm Kala Barrage. Schools across the country are expected to see several improvements next year, according to plans laid out in the 2017 budget. Among them are proposed security systems for all schools. Prime Minister Harris outlined some of the upcoming developments. We have provided for capital expenditure of 19.4 million, which will cover expenditure anticipated for the Bastia High School, outfitting of affect, repairs to the roof at the industrial site decay center, to the bathrooms at Tucker Clark, construction of a preschool for Sandy Point, and so on. On Thursday, Minister of Education, the Honorable Sean Richards, said the previous administration neglected the school buildings, and now the current government has to address numerous problems. Yeah. The teachers over there complain that Kayan High was being neglected. Yeah. That is the complaint coming out of Kayan, that they were being neglected. Yeah. Sandy Point High, you go down there, had to repair a whole roof down there. About three wheelbarrows of bad feces were removed when we removed the ceiling down there, Mr. Speaker. Almost every single school, every Mr. School Speaker. You go over Tabernacle right now, we're supposed to be doing some work over there starting next week. Every single classroom over there leaking. HD Security Services, a local security consulting firm, installed security systems at Keon High School and will next week start the installation of security systems at the Charles E. Mills Secondary School, Sadler Secondary School, Bert Charles High, and the Washington Archibald High School. Minister of Tourism Honorable Lindsay Grant says throughout the year the government has given persons working in the tourism industry an opportunity to improve their standard of living through training and human resource development. Minister Grant was at the time addressing Parliament on Friday. He spoke of some of the training that has been undertaken. We're not just talking about the fact that we're bringing in a lot of people into the country, they're spending a lot of money. No, we're not only about that. Because this government is about building capacity of its people. And so while we're bringing in the ships, while we're bringing in the passengers, at the same time, we're training our people in the industry. And so this year alone, between August and October of this year, we trained 662 people on the front line. Minister Grant said the government continues to create opportunities for the people. 662 people trained by this government to make sure that we are at a standard that is of the highest quality and producing um, the types of services is required in this industry. And this government is a government of opportunities. Yes, 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 yes. This government is a government that ensures that the people are looked after first. Minister of Tourism, Honorable Lindsay Grant. 
The Ministry of Tourism in St. Kitts and Nevis is focusing on attracting more high-end and discerning travelers as part of further development of the hotel and other key industries that depend heavily on tourist arrivals to the Federation. In the 2017 budget address, Prime Minister Dr. the Honorable Timothy Harris stated that national and foreign developers have continued to demonstrate confidence and commitment to the Federation through sustained investment in substantial projects that will expand the number of hotel rooms and amenities necessary to attract more high-end discerning travelers. With the opening of the Caribbean's first Park Hyatt Hotel St. Kitts Christoph Harbour, the hotel has already been named one of the most anticipated hotel openings by internationally recognized publications such as the New York Times and Forbes magazine. Additionally, the accommodations at Park Hyatt St. Kitts Christoph Harbour will not only appeal to the upscale traveler but will provide permanent employment opportunities for citizens when its doors open in 2017. The developers of the hotel have confirmed that the first group of 150 persons is nearing completion of the initial training in preparation for employment when the hotel opens. On Thursday, St. Kitts and Nevis joined other member states to observe CARICOM Cuba Day. During his address to commemorate the day, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Aviation, the Honorable Mark Brantley, expressed warm greetings to the government and people of Cuba. On behalf, therefore, of the citizens and government of St. Kitts and Nevis, I would like to thank the government and people of the Republic of Cuba for its continued support and interaction and wish all a happy and united CARICOM Cuba Day. Minister Brantley described CARICOM Cuba Day as one to celebrate fruitful relationships, the strengthening of ties and the importance of cordial and productive relations. This year, St. Kitts and Nevis and Cuba celebrated 21 years of fruitful relations and the establishment of diplomatic ties. The government of St. Kitts and Nevis holds in highest regard its relationship with the people and government of the Republic of Cuba. St. Kitts and Nevis has not only benefited through the multilateral CARICOM Cuba arrangement, but also bilaterally. We admire and acknowledge with deep appreciation the influential leadership of the late former President Fidel Castro Ruz and his vision of building camaraderie. Minister Brantley spoke of the many persons that have received scholarships under the Cuba and St. Kitts and Nevis relations. Currently, 21 students are pursuing studies in Cuba. And to date, a total of over 100 students have graduated from Cuban institutions and have embarked on careers that have positively impacted every facet of our society, especially in education, health, agriculture, and even the private sector. The level of commitment of the government of Cuba to contribute to capacity building and human resource development was once again demonstrated this academic year through the offer of 10 scholarships in the areas of medicine, civil aviation, health technology, and medical specialities in the forms of postgraduate scholarships. Minister Brantley also commended Cuba for the policies that have brought about positive changes in agriculture, the private sector, and taxes over the past year. After the break, winners announced in the tourism photo competition, and the countdown is on to the Soka Monarch semifinals. We'll tell you more when we come back. The Ministry of Tourism has announced Rashid Stanley as the winner of the Old But New Pastiche competition. The announcement was made during an award ceremony held at the Ministry of Tourism on Thursday. Stanley received an iPhone 7 as his prize. Second place went to Paolo Tuit, who received an Xbox One. Tuit's submission also won him the special prize after his post received the most likes on Facebook. Third place in the competition, Carissa St. Just, walked away with a new 20-inch bike. The old but new pastiche competition asked for persons, mainly young people, to find all photographs of buildings or historical sites across the island. The next step encouraged persons to go to those locations, line up the old photograph with its modern-day counterpart, and snap a picture of the combined image. The submissions were then posted to the Faces of Tourism Facebook page, where the winner was selected. The photo competition was created to spotlight the history of the Federation. The old but new pastiche competition was held in November to commemorate Tourism Awareness Month. 
After two rounds of eliminations held two weeks ago, soccer artists are set to square off on Friday night at Carnival Village at the Sugar Mass 45 Soccer Monarch semifinals. 34 artists, 20 Groovy and 14 Power will try to make it in the top seven in both categories to advance to the final round to challenge the reigning kings. According to the rules of the competition, artists will be scored in three areas, lyrics, music and performance. The artists, however, are not allowed to perform with any dancers. The finals are scheduled for December 24th at the Sugar Mill, where the semi-finalists will make an attempt to dethrone Goofy King Nature B and Power King Mr. Hype. Musical support for the Soka Monarch competition will be provided by the Bacchanalis crew. Better late than never is the phrase echoed throughout social media by many local band lovers who have been getting a taste of their favorite bands with the release of the Collision Band last night and the four-time Road Mash champion Small Axe Band earlier this week. In an attempt to capture the Road Mash title once again, the Small Axe Band released their Sugar Mass 45 album entitled Warrior on Wednesday with ZIZ's DJ Ronnie Rascal. The band's manager, Gregory Warner, said he has no doubt Small Axe will capture their fifth title this year and warned the other bands to shift on the side and stay far from the Warriors. Meanwhile, in an interview with Sister Sensia on Thursday night, the Collision Band also released their five-track album entitled Sting Them. Over the past weeks, fans have taken to social media calling for the bands to release their music. Local soca artists had been announcing their music since September. Fans are now waiting to hear from the New Vibes Band and the Grandmasters Band to see what they have to offer for Sugar Mass 45. Coming up, Antigua and Barbuda Mac, Caricom Cuba Day. For the details when we come back. Antigua and Barbuda marked Caricom Cuba Day on Thursday with the signing of an agreement for an extension of a key public health pact between Antigua and Barbuda and Cuba. Formal diplomatic relations between Cuba and Antigua and Barbuda date back over two decades and that has yielded several agreements, especially in the area of health care. Thursday was a fitting day for the signing for an extended public health agreement between both countries. The signatories were the Ministry of Public Health of the Republic of Cuba, represented by Ambassador His Excellency Gustavo Vilez Oliveres, and Health and Environment Minister for Antigua and Barbuda, the Honorable Marvin Joseph. Minister Joseph noted that the signing of this agreement is in recognition of the cooperation that exists between the two countries. My signing today, in the context of the passing of one of the greatest revolutionaries that this world has ever seen, Commandante Fidel Castro is somewhat of a celebration of the success of his legacy in cementing a reliable, trustworthy, and important relationship of solidarity not only with Antigua and Barbuda, but with several Caribbean nations. The minister reiterated Cuba's contribution in the area of health care. Without the support of Cuba, Antigua would not be able to deliver the quality and expansiveness of health services that we deliver today. Cuba is therefore an integral part of how we service our people in terms of our, our health care and an integral part in terms of how we develop specialties in the area of healthcare. Cuban Ambassador Gustavo Vilez Oliveras paid tribute to the late Cuban revolutionary leader Fidel Castro after signing the agreement. He said Cuba's support for countries of the Caribbean and by extension around the world was the vision of the late leader. Citizens of Trinidad are calling for something to be done immediately regarding the country's crime situation. The body of a 20-year-old Shannon Banfield was found on Thursday afternoon stuffed into a box in the storage room of a home goods store, I Am and Company. According to reports, the body bore marks of violence and her clothing had been torn. Homicide detectives have detained two employees from I Am Company Limited in connection with the murder. 
Matthew Maharaj and Dil Sikran surrendered at the police station around 7.30 p.m., hours after police had earlier sent out a bulletin saying there were persons of interest in the investigation. It has been reported that both men from San Juan had failed to show up for work since Banfield was reported missing by relatives on Monday night. Investigators have said they would wait until an autopsy is performed to determine her cause of death. Coming up, referendum in Italy expected in February. The details when we come back. Italy could have a new election as early as February after the weekend's decisive referendum which sealed the fate of Prime Minister Matteo Renzi. A caretaker government also needs to be appointed. The surprise was not that Italy's constitutional referendum went against the government, but that it did so by a margin of almost 20%. The biggest winner, the anti-establishment five-star movement that threatens to take Italy out of the euro and may be set now to win the next election. This country has had 65, 68 governments in the last 70 years. What confidence do you have that the Five Star Movement can come and go as anything more than a footnote in history? So we have our own ideas. We have nothing to share with people that has destroyed, have destroyed our country in the last 30 years. Look, look internationally. I mean, if you go through Brexit, the Trump election, and all the movements that are rising up in all around Europe, they are connected not by their own uh, uh, origins, but the feeling of people. Everywhere in Europe, there is this sentiment to bring voice back to people. Much had been made of the possibility of a narrow populist victory. Was this, then, something of an uprising? No, that is not correct. There is a general atmosphere in democracies that is an atmosphere that makes it difficult for incumbent governments uh, and for the political establishments, and Italy participates in, in this environment. But the idea that the Brexit vote or Trump's election have had a direct influence in moving Italian voters uh, and that these phenomena are all in the same basket, uh, this is simply not true. What the Italian referendum does do, however, is further undermine the by now standard establishment case against voter dissent, that of financial markets in freefall, of the economy going off a cliff edge. It may happen in time, of course, but it hasn't happened yet. Italy's banks, its oldest in particular, are in trouble, saddled with billions of dollars worth of loans that can't be repaid, struggling like the country as a whole to shake off decades of economic stagnation. That Italy now joins France, Germany and others in facing elections that could destabilize the EU is not because of populism, but rather the successive failures of many governments over many years. Jonah Hull, Al Jazeera, Rome. I'm next in sports, SKNFA host first all girls football competition and Trinidad and Tobago gets a new national women's football coach. Stay tuned. Kiss Nevis Football Association is currently developing a female primary school football tournament expected to begin next year. On Friday morning, a primary school girls competition was held to introduce the idea to players from various schools and get them on the field working together. 
During the brief opening ceremony, Lenny Lake, technical director of the SKNFA, said one of the association's goals is to increase the number of local female players. We do indeed see this as one of our future development to make sure that women, females, continue playing the game. And we are hoping that in the next few years that we go from 100 female players to 200 and then 300. Because eventually we want to make sure that in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, we have girls playing football just like boys. First Caribbean International Bank sponsored the event and Representative Jewel Watley said her company is happy to be associated with the initiative. CIBC First Caribbean throughout the region is committed towards the development of the communities which we operate in. Therefore, sponsoring an event like this that aids in the development of youths, more so the development of a sport that is predominant or predominantly male to be able to facilitate the implementation of a girls program is something that we definitely would want to participate in and see grow to something great. Eight schools took part in the competition. At the end of it all, Beach Allen Primary came out as champion after defeating Aristown Primary 1-0. The Trinidad and Tobago Football Association recently unveiled a new women's coach and technical director. Here's more. A former Italian national team player in the 70s and 80s, referred to as the Maradona of the women's game. I was pretty good. <laughs> Carolina Morace is football royalty in Italy. Carolina Morace has since built a coaching CV that easily qualifies her to coach any men's team. In fact, she was most recently technical director at a men's team down in Australia. But now, she's been brought in by the TTFA, her role defined by the president, David John Williams. She is scheduled to take up her job on the 16th of January, um, at which time she will join us with a complete range of staff, including an assistant coach, for the senior women's team, who will be the head coach of the women's under 20, as well as an assistant coach for the under 20 team, who will be the head coach of the under 17 team. Morace herself says she wants to ensure a new approach to management and development. Uh, I would like to forget, to forget the past years and focus uh, on the journey ahead with a new vision and introduce professionalism. I have a high expectation. Her appointment has impressed regular team captain Maley Atten Johnson, but even so, the veteran of many failed revolutions says an impressive CV can only do so much. We, we as players want to, to see something that we can be committed to again. Um, for me personally, I understand that it's not a boat right to represent my country. It's always an honor and a privilege. And we have done that throughout our entire careers. However, we have to live. And I would like for her to come in and demand that, that the players get respect. More than 1,000 Russian athletes, including Olympic medalists, are implicated in the McLaren report on Russia's state-sponsored doping. An independent investigation into Russian state-sponsored doping in sport says more than a thousand athletes benefited from an institutional conspiracy to conceal positive tests. The second part of the report, commissioned for the World Anti-Doping Agency, claims several championships and some 30 sports were affected. The author, a Canadian lawyer, said the Russian team corrupted the London Olympics. The evidence does not depend on verbal testimony from anyone to draw a conclusion. Rather, it tests the physical evidence and a conclusion is drawn from the results. The results of the forensic and laboratory analysis initiated by the IP established that the conspiracy was perpetrated from at least 2011 to 2015.
The author says there's evidence that more than 500 positive tests were reported as negative, including from top-level athletes. A Moscow laboratory was involved in a urine swapping system used at the Sochi Winter Olympics, the report says. There was proof of bottle tampering and some athletes with impossible test results. The exposure of state-sponsored doping in Russia led to a partial ban of Russian athletes at this year's Rio Olympics. Russian officials have dismissed the latest report as the work of only one individual. When we come back, we'll have another look at the stories that made the headlines. Recapping the top stories, government outlines how education will benefit from 2017 budget. Tourism minister reflects on advancements in human resource development. And Prime Minister Harris says the Federation is focusing on attracting high-end travelers. And that's the end of the ZIZ Channel 5 newscast. Thank you for joining us. I'm Carla Verage. Goodbye.